We're doing tenor now. We got um, Kaylee Jones. You might have seen her on our show before. Maybe. She's going to demonstrate tenor. All right. So this is a tenor drum. <laughs> we, uh, oh, uh, we did, we've done this with all the other instruments here because you don't know how heavy this is. You can hold this. See, that's the lightest one, though. So. Okay, I was going to yeah. say, this feels a little better than the snare. Yeah. Okay. So tenor, there's a lot of variability with tenor, as we were just kind of talking off, off air about. Um, the drums are different sizes, and kind of the point of that is, like, that you have different notes of tenor drums. So whereas your smallest drum in your band, this is the smallest one we have, and it's a 15-inch diameter. <clears throat> The next biggest one might be a 16, and then you might have an 18, and I've even seen 20-inch tenors, which I get that people, you know, like because it has such a big booming sound. Um, but in comparison to some human beings such as myself, <laughs> that is huge. So um, this one's a this one's a 15-inch, and there's different things that people have going on for slings or harnesses. Um, it's kind of frowned upon to use a double shoulder harness like uh, Cody demonstrated with the snare drum last episode, because if you do that, then when you do any flourishing for the, that we do in tenor drumming, you can't get your arms up and it really messes with your shoulders and it's super uncomfortable. So <laughs> for lack of any better thing, um, it's kind of been more standard to continue to use the slings, which they used to use with snare drum and then stopped, like you said last episode. But yeah, we use a leather sling that's got a broad leather strap. Um, I know some people use canvas or some people might use like a seatbelt kind of material. And some people have like a strap that goes around your waist. We just use the strap around the shoulder generally. Um, shout out to Erica who has experimented with more types of slings than I can shake a stick at. <laughs> She's found something else that works a little bit better for her um, in like a different kind of, she has a strap and then another strap that goes like over the other shoulder, but has managed to make it so that the drum still sits on one leg, which is also, I feel like I'm talking a lot, but <laughs> the thing about the one leg is very important because the snare drummers, their drum is held up by the harness, whereas on tenor, or if you use a sling for a snare drum, um, you hold the drum with your leg. And some people use leg rests. I personally don't because I don't feel like I need it. Um, that's probably just an individual preference. I just balance the drum on my left leg I've seen a lot of people do that. I've seen a lot of people use leg rests. I kind of recommend people try out what's comfortable for them. Um, but yeah, when you're marching, you just keep the drum on the left leg. Anything you play is going to be on the drum and then um, in the middle of the drum, the sweet spot. And you have to kind of get the drum in a good position on your shoulder where it's going to stay there. And then on your leg where it's going to stay there. And then you just you keep it there and it just stays there and you just play and march. So, and regarding flourishing, there's all kinds of crazy arm positions that we do. We do anything from down out at the side, um, from like a um, straight out kind of T pose and lower down kind of pose up to all the way up above the head with a fully extended arm, except, um, ergonomically, as you'll probably mention, you don't want to lock your arms or anything like that because that's just not, not comfortable. So the other thing that I think, uh, we didn't talk about regarding snare drumming, but I think it probably also does apply to snare is that when we play on the drum, like we have, um, rhythm things that we play actually triplets or whatever, um, different runs that you do. I always tell people, you want to make sure that your hands are pointing down as in palms down on the drum because I've seen a lot of people play and I think it's just because you're coming out of a flourish and you don't really know how to play the drum after you just done a flourish. I see a lot of people play with the palms um, like facing inward so that you're kind of like striking the drum like in an in a in a motion that's not very ergonomic for you. So I always tell people, you know, hands facing down to play the drum, it'll give you more flexibility because that's how your hands are meant to move anyway. So 
That's my explanation of tenor drum. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> so you already touched on a lot of points. I'm going to make a couple observations for maybe why Kaylee does a couple of the things that she does. Um, go ahead and face me a little bit. Now, something that Kaylee already touched on, I was using a really broad strap. And one of the reasons that we want to do that, or you guys want to do that, would be it helps to disperse that weight a little bit more. So if you think about using like a rope versus something really broad, it would be the difference between stepping on a stair or stepping on a Lego. One of those is going to be, well, but neither of them are going to be terribly comfortable, but one's going to be a lot worse. So what we want to do is make sure that that strap is not only set appropriately. So I was just going to say, you want to move that a little bit further away from the neck, but not directly on top of the shoulder. What we have here is you have your collarbone, what we call the clavicle, and it connects to the top of the shoulder at a spot called the acromioclavicular joint. And it's a really fancy way of saying that bone that you can feel on top of your shoulder right there is that joint. And if you're putting a lot of pressure there, you could risk making that joint a little bit more unstable and it's going to be uncomfortable. So especially like Kaylee said, and you're probably not going to do that anyways, because you have to do those overhead flourishes. If you have that strap set too far out, you're going to be at risk for altering the mechanics of your joint and it's not going to allow you to go overhead. And from a repetitive amount of time doing that, you could end up with an injury inside that joint. And that's something we're, of course, trying to avoid. Something else to pay attention to is not only where the strap is placed, this is something that we talked about off air, was if you want to have a little bit more cushioning for the strap, and that's just really to protect the skin in that area, especially starting out as a new tenor drummer, you want to make sure that if you haven't built up any type of callusing on those areas that are constantly having pressure, you want to help your body ease into that so you're not having any kind of blister or skin breakdown. So let's see, go ahead, face Adela for me. So Kaylee already said about not using a, a rest, a knee rest. And from how you explain that, it really does sound like that's a little bit more based on preference. Um, but what you want to make sure of is, go ahead, bend your, bend your knee for me. Like that, or uh, stand up straight and kick your leg back. Yeah, just like that. So you want to make sure that that drum isn't hitting on your kneecap. Again, from that biomechanical standpoint, you want to make sure that that's hitting in more of a soft tissue protected area as long as you're not seeing well Adele like you said you've seen some bruising so you want to make sure you're trying to avoid that as much as possible hard to do when you're playing for so long but making sure that that's not contacting the bone for an extended or repetitive amount of time let's see what else do we want to cover so something that I actually like a little bit more about the snare drum than the tenor I'm sorry is that you have to hold yourself symmetrically. So with the harness, you're, yes, I know. <laughs> so with the harness, you're already seeing that you're allowed to stay a little bit more upright without having to work as hard. Now for a tenor drum, I'm gonna move your hair a little bit. Thank you. You're already seeing that her strap is actually trying to pull her right shoulder into a little bit more of that rounded position. So that takes a little more effort on her end to really watch. So. Something that we were saying earlier was if you're in between songs of a long set, you want to make sure you're doing that quick posture check because a lot of times, go ahead and just kind of let those shoulders round forward. So this is a really good example, especially try and go all the way up for a flourish now. <laughs> Ow, right? It's not good. It's not comfortable. So draw those shoulder blades down and back for me. Now go up for that flourish. There you go. Much, much easier. And after doing that a repetitive amount of time, you want to make sure that you're in that good position. Essentially, what's happening without getting too much into the PT detail would be if you're in that rounded position, you're, you hold that for me, thank you. So think of a ball in the socket here, and when you're going to go, we'll switch that here, when you're going to go lift your arm up, if that socket is in that forward position, so go ahead around for me, that bone that we talked about, the acromion comes forward. So when you go to lift your arm, that bone is almost bumping around in that bone and that joint's not moving the way that it should. So coming back up, you're in that centered position. And as you raise your arm up, your shoulder blade is going to come back down and your arm can come up a lot more easily. So something to watch for, especially like I said, being that she has an asymmetrical and a cross body position, that's something that you really want to pay attention to. Now I've got you all paranoid, huh? I'm all paranoid now. <laughs> I don't feel right doing anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I like, too, what you said about your hand positioning. And so we talked about this again off air. You don't want to approach it with a karate chop motion. You actually have less motion 
when you're doing that handshaking motion than you do when you're flexing up and down. And that is a much natural, more natural motion. You can kind of develop almost, um, uh, what word am I looking for? Kind of just that, that natural bounce that you don't have to put as much effort into. And that's again, going to help reduce your risk of having any kind of repetitive injury, um, something that we talked about was about tennis elbow and being in that position for a long amount of time can really actually irritate the elbow after a while. So being in that palm position and just kind of using that natural way the body moves can help to avoid those things. Plus it makes you play better because it's, play faster, yeah. it's easier. <laughs> so do either of you guys have any questions since you both play? Uh, we covered a lot of it. I, th I think, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, in some ways. So I know when we when we first were talking about the tenor drum off air, you said so it just goes on one shoulder. That's horrible. <laughs> it's uncomfortable, and it is uncomfortable. But in some ways, um, a lot of times I think tenor drummers aren't like playing as much because we're not playing constantly. Usually, you have different size drums that are playing at different times. You might have long stretches of flourishes, but there's kind of there's a little bit more downtime in the middle of a tune um, to kind of just think, oh, wait, I need to pull my shoulders back or whatever. Um, so that I think can help a lot. Yeah. I think it's also um, I don't know. There's also a pressure to feel like you look good playing tenor. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think a lot of people have as many posture issues as maybe bagpipers who are concentrating more on just what they're playing or snares who are concentrating more on what they're playing we feel like okay someone's looking at me for sure so i need to make sure i look good <laughs> yeah and that's a good way to think about it you already have that built in so the times that would be good for you is if you're trying to learn something new and practice okay make sure i'm still in that good position no mm -hmm. one's necessarily watching what i'm doing for a performance aspect but i need to watch how i'm holding myself yeah so. cool all right let's bring on the bass drum Go, go, go. Okay. Yes. Uh, now we've got Alex here with the yes. bass. This is the bass. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, you hold it like this. It has a similar harness to what the snares have. So it has, you know, like the plate right here and then the little whale tail thing that can adjust and slide around. Um, so that helps, like Cody said, to lock it into who, what your body type is and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, sometimes it slides for me, so I got to kind of adjust the harness as I go. Um, and usually how I'm playing, I just, we do like a swooping motion like this is how we'll play the bass drum. So, I mean, that's about it. And then like, as far as marching, similar to the snares, we don't have like, we can't get all the way up, but just enough to get your feet off the ground yeah. and, and move. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. That's, that's about it. <laughs> and like you said, band rest for you is taking the whole yeah taking whole it all off. off or just kind of standing there if they if they don't want me to take the drum off does that so, happen a lot just sometimes standing. yeah okay. just because they want the bands to like look good and be all at attention or whatever so i kind of have to stand there sometimes and hold the drum for a long amount of time <laughs> yeah i'm sure that can get kind of tiring yeah it's, it's something that we touched on mm -hmm. off air just being in the correct position so i'm actually gonna have you yeah, swap <laughs> go ahead do a yeah full turn for me there so I already like, we talked about this already, but I like a couple of things. So the plate in front, again, hitting right above the two hip bones. And also I do like this whale tail. That's a really neat design, but it's allowing you to keep that good thoracic position. So, and of course, really hard to do with the bass drum, but you really can't let yourself come forward. Otherwise you're going to follow. Yeah. Otherwise you're <laughs> going to tip forward and that, that wouldn't look so good. Yeah. Um, so it's already keeping you in that nice position. So what I would be most concerned about, especially because this is the, largest instrument and again you can see how far away the end of the instrument gets from Alex's center of mass from essentially the center of his body where he's holding himself so if you're not in that good position again it will tip you over but when you stand for a long amount of time with the drum on you can start doing a lot of funny things to compensate one of the things that I asked you before was how does your low back feel kind of yeah. tired kind of tired kind of tired, yeah. tired and so what we want to avoid is having that curvature start coming so this is where that breathing comes into play you want to have that abdominal engagement and you almost want to feel like your low back is flattening a little bit so something that i found to be helpful for when i'm standing a long time at work or i play golf so you need to have good control of 
your lumbar region, your thoracic region, and your pelvic region is to be able to do tilting motions. So when I tell my patients at work, if they're having a hard time with that control, you almost want to think sticking your butt out or bringing your butt back in. So a good way to say it is if you had like a tail, you'd want to stick your tail up or you'd want to tuck it between your legs. Developing that kind of control can really help to protect the low back, engage the subdominals, and especially, like I said, when you have all that weight so far away from your center of mass, to be able to control that from your core is going to make you the most comfortable without you doing a lot of that work. Very cool. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what questions do you have for um, around it? Or I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Like, because we were saying off mic too, like sometimes if I'm standing there for a long time, I'll feel like I'm like leaning back to compensate. Yeah. And I don't know. I assume that's not good. <laughs> right. So that's causing that same thing, kind of that arching motion. Yeah. So you want to make sure, and it's hard to do because you don't want to be in that position for a long mm -hmm. time, but you have to move. Yeah. So even just developing kind of that slow motion back and forth versus finding a static position. Okay. Now, of course, I know, especially if like you're standing at that attention, you don't want to kind of be, I, <laughs> if I were you guys, I'd be like all over the place, <laughs> moving around one for the other. I'm sure that's frowned upon. Mm -hmm. But if you're able to develop kind of those slow controlled motions, I almost think about it too, and something we touched on off air was making sure that when you're standing at attention that you're not locking your knees out. I hope no one's seen anyone pass out, but you kind of hear those horror <laughs> stories of like people who are on guard or in band that they lock their knees and they suddenly wake up on the floor. And what's happening there when you lock out your knees is your calf muscles are a major muscle pump for your blood. And so if you're locked out and you're not engaging those muscles, blood starts to pool, you're not getting enough blood up to the brain, you end up on the floor. So a lot of times people will just slowly bend their knees or alternate which one they're bending. It's kind of that same thing. It's just that slow motion, but making those muscles work. So if it's kind of finding that area where you're able to go back and forth, that's something that could help. Cool. All right. So now we're going to show you some stretches that you can do at home. Uh, and once again, this is a video special episode. It's also on audio on if you're listening to us in your earbuds. But if you want to see the video of these stretches, head on over to YouTube, our Podband Pipecast page, and it'll be on there too. So let's get to it. So we're going to demonstrate a couple really easy stretches that you can either do before you're playing, in between sets, or after. They're all going to have a benefit. They're going to help to improve your range of motion, help to keep some of your soft tissue, like your muscle, your tendons, your ligaments, moving a little bit better and more freely, and help you down the road for injury prevention. So a couple things that we're going to do for Cody are more looking at neck stretches. So I'm going to have you bring one ear down to your shoulder making sure that as you're doing this, you're keeping that shoulder down. You don't want the shoulder coming up to meet the ear, the ear coming down. Now, you have good range of motion, Cody, but tell me, are you feeling a stretch anywhere right now? Yeah, feeling one like right here. Good. Yeah. So what we're stretching right now is called your upper trapezius. And it's something that we talked about a little earlier that if you're using those extra muscles to help you breathe, that's what lifts your shoulder up. So being able to hold that position for about 20 to 30 seconds while doing some of that deep breathing allows you to relax a little bit more. Go ahead, bring your head up to that position. We're gonna do two more variations that hit different muscles. So what I'll have you do, Cody, and I'll come face you here, is you're gonna bring your ear down to your shoulder, same position, and then your nose is going to go towards your armpit. Good. So obviously feeling a stretch on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. Do you feel it in a different area than you did on the other side? Yeah, I would say like more towards the front down more here. More towards yeah. the front, good. So we're looking at your levator scapulae muscle here, which sits more towards the back of the shoulder and then comes around the front a little bit. So go ahead, try the same thing on the other side. You're gonna side bend first and then turn your head down. Good. Something that you want to pay attention to as well. Like I said, you don't want the shoulder to come meet the nose or meet the ear. And you also don't want the opposite shoulder to start rising up. You want that to stay down. Now, I'm showing the easier versions of these stretches, but for someone like Cody, who has a little bit more mobility, if they want a more advanced stretch, they can actually use their hand at the top of their head to bring it down and then turn. It's just gonna increase the intensity of the stretch. So just do this to your level of comfort. 
you feel that you're getting a little more pull there. Yeah, definitely. Yep. So it just depends on the person. And like I said, you want to make sure that shoulder stays down. So if you're doing this in a seated position, you can hold on to the edge of a chair to do that. Or you can just put your hand more behind your back. That's just going to lock that position out so you can't compensate so much. Third one we're going to do, again, starting in that tilted position. And instead of you turning your nose down towards your armpit, I want you to turn it up towards the ceiling. Good. A little bit different there as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So still feeling the stretch on this side. Yeah. But where? Um, more towards the back, it seems like. More towards the back. Yeah. Okay. So now we're stretching some of the scaling muscles. And again, this is a really good stretch to do for the pipers because if you've been playing for a long time, go ahead and hold that for about 10 more seconds. Mm -hmm. If you've been playing for a long time and you're starting to feel like you're using your shoulders a little bit more for breathing, this is one of those muscles that tries to help elevate the rib cage. So you want to make sure that you're stretching those out. Ideally, you're using more of that belly breathing technique like we talked about earlier. All right, go ahead, relax. We're going to do one that's not a stretch. So we talked about this a little bit with Diana, our piper. Go ahead and turn to face the wall for me. And it's that chin tuck exercise. Now, this is good to do when you are playing or when you're at rest and trying to maintain that good position. And this is also a really good exercise to do just in your daily life. Like I said, if you find yourself at the computer working a lot, if you have a long drive, your head tends to come into that forward position you kind of see my shoulders already rounded out so what we want to do is bring those shoulders back and then work on that tuck so go ahead put your uh put your chin forward a little bit for me first cody good position that we don't ideally want but it's good to be able to move in and out of that position and recognize what position you're you're holding your head in so go ahead and retract good just that tucking motion really good to start with these in a mirror because you'll realize that what feels like a tuck back may actually be a tuck down or a tuck up and that's not what we're looking for we're just looking for that horizontal motion now you don't need to hold these necessarily as long as the stretch ideally stretches for about 20 to 30 seconds but for a chin tuck you can hold that for about five to ten go ahead and come to that forward position again good and now go ahead and tuck the chin back again for me good feel okay yeah. Good. Now we're not looking to push into pain with any of these. So if you're having any aggravating symptoms, just minimize that range of motion a little more. And if you feel like you can go a little further after a couple repetitions, try that. All right. So that's a good set of neck exercises. Good for anyone in the band to do. And like I said, good to do in just your daily life. All right. Okay. Next one. Cool. Thank you, Cody. Yep. Okay. <laughs> now some stretches, uh, well, for everyone, but specifically pipers and tenors, which are interestingly more alike than you might think. <laughs> yeah. So if you think about with pipers and tenors, they're both, and with snares and bass, like I said, these are good for everyone, but you're using your forearms a lot in a lot of different positions. And for tenors, especially you're reaching up and overhead a lot. So we want to make sure that the shoulder joints are staying as mobile as possible and that all the muscles that surround them are loose. So the first exercise we're going to do is an overhead tricep stretch. So Diana, if you could reach behind your head for me, good. This is a really familiar one that people do in the gym a lot. So making sure when you still do these, you still wanna have that good upright posture and not coming forward. And Diane, just to check, you're feeling a stretch right through here. Perfect. And again, 20 to 30 seconds is ideal, not pushing into a lot of pain. So if you're not pushing down or bringing your arm in quite as much, that's okay. All right, when you're ready, yep. Very good. And like I said, these are good to do before practice starts and then after you've had a long day of practice or a long day of performing. All right, when you're ready. Next thing we're gonna do is a cross body stretch. So this helps a couple things. It can help to stretch out your deltoid and it can also help to stretch out the back of your shoulder capsule. And when that gets really tight, like I said earlier, that can affect your biomechanics of how well you're able to reach your arm up overhead. So we wanna make sure that that's staying mobile. So go ahead, reach across, you pick which arm. Good. Now, again, we don't wanna push into pain with this one. So everyone's gonna to tolerate this a little bit differently. Can you raise your arm up a little bit more that way? Good, just like that. And as you're doing this one, Diane, can you bring your shoulder blade back a little bit? Good. Did you notice that your shoulder kind of started coming up towards your mm -hmm. ear? So another good thing is you're learning to do these 
making sure that you're doing them in a mirror just for a little bit of feedback. Or if you have someone watching you saying, hey, keep your shoulder down, should be feeling a good stretch right through the back of the shoulder. You might even feel a little bit at the top as long as it's not a painful pinching sensation. That's okay. Should just feel a little bit of tightness. All right, go ahead, try the other side for me. Perfect, and you already corrected that without me saying anything. Very good. All righty. So next ones we're gonna do are more for the forearm muscles. These can be frequently ignored for a lot of people in sports. Like I said before, I'm a golfer, so these are always muscles that I want to stretch and make sure they're limbered and ready to go. So one way to do this, I'll tuck this in right here. You're gonna bring both your palms together. Good, and I want you to bring your palms down and just let your elbows come out to the sides. Good. Should be feeling a stretch almost right along the palm side of the hand and then up into the forearm. Again, you wanna make sure that you're not pushing into a lot of pain, so just do what you can tolerate if you start here and you feel like you can work your way down, that's good. You can even add in a little bit of rotation, good. And remember with stretching, it's not a fast movement. Slow and controlled, go ahead, rotate up towards you again. Very good, feel okay? Mm -hmm. Good. Something to watch for with this one, and people will be familiar with this if you've ever experienced carpal tunnel syndrome. If you start experiencing any kind of prolonged tingling or numbness in the hands, that's something you're gonna want to address with a healthcare provider. Go see a PT, go see your primary care physician to make sure that there's nothing else going on. I don't anticipate that, but again, if you have a history of that or if you've had those symptoms for a long time, you want to make sure you're getting them looked at appropriately. And then last one we're gonna go over. There are two variations. This is gonna look really similar. It just stretches the muscles a little differently. Is bringing your hand out. Let your hand just drop. And then using your other hand to pull your hand back just like that. Again, about 20 to 30 seconds there. A variation of this is actually keeping your elbow in a bent position. So you're gonna be in that same position here. Drop the hand down and press. Very good. Making sure you're doing both sides. Perfect. Alrighty. So now we're going to talk about the internet's favorite thing, feet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. So um, we're going to talk about shoes, which we've made jokes about multiple times in the past because it seems like uh, it's impossible to find good, comfortable band shoes. Our band shoes are called Gilly Brogues, and these that I have are actually probably more ergonomic than uh, other ones. Traditionally, when quotes, the, the Gilly Brogues have a really thin sole that's pretty much just a little piece of leather, and you don't so much see these big tire treads that I have on these. Um, but these ones are a lot more comfortable because they have more of that padding. Um, and my shoes don't have a tap on them. I know some people have a tap. That's just a little piece of metal that goes on the heel so that when you walk, it sounds pretty, I guess. Um, I don't know. I don't have that. A lot of people I know don't have it. It kind of seems to be falling out of fashion. But anyway, these are my shoes. I do have inserts that I put in the shoes, but I think for now we're just going to talk about the shoe and the foot. Yes. So something I like about these shoes already is the fact that they're so thick, thick soled. Can't say that. Because when you're walking for a long time, you want something with a lot of support. I also like, and something that we didn't really talk about is... The toe box on the shoe is a lot wider, so your toes aren't going to get jammed up in the shoe for how long you're walking for. Have you worn shoes like that before? Yes. <laughs> the worst. It's not fun. So those are two things I already like about the shoe. Now, I'm going to preface this. Everyone's feet are a little bit different, so what works for one person might not work as well for the other. So we want to just keep that in mind as we're going through. We were talking about feet a little bit earlier before we started recording, and like I said, everyone has a little bit of different arches so depending on that their arch support might be different the shoe itself and it's really hard to see but it doesn't really offer a lot of support on that inner arch so for someone who typically while working out or walking long distances if they're already wearing arch support i'd recommend getting some for the shoes kaylee already had uh, there we go just a really nice just over-the-counter gel 
orthotic, which is really good just to help, especially with heel support. But anything more than that, I, I would recommend looking at something with a little bit more arch support. If you're suffering from something like plantar fasciitis, which is a sharp pain on the medial side of your, of your foot, on the bottom of your foot, talk to your doctor or your physical therapist first for their recommendation, and that way they can help you to pick out the correct type of shoe, uh, not necessarily shoe, but the right type of orthotic or footwear to support you. So a couple of other things that we can do, and I don't know what will be easiest because we're going to be pointed down towards the floor to see my, yeah, just my feet. Down. Yes, that'd be great. So my feet are not going to be in this episode. Sorry. <laughs> I know. Patreon exclusive, right? No. Uh, Alex will demonstrate with her feet because she's a professional at this. <laughs> so a couple things that you can do after playing for a long time to help with any type of foot pain or soreness. You can either do um, a calf stretch. So you can do this preferably sitting. I'm just going to show it standing. But you can pull the toes up feeling a stretch right here. Something else I really like, like I said, I'm a golfer. So I'd use a golf ball, but if someone prefers to use, um, if they have like a small foam roll at home, or some people, if they like icing their feet, um, throwing a, a frozen water bottle or taking a frozen water bottle out of the freezer and using it, you can roll that along your foot. Again, I recommend doing the seated so that way you're eliminating the balance component of this. You want to make sure that you're more relaxed, but just rolling that along the bottom of your foot, you can get that angle right there, can be really helpful. Something else just to help with the balance component and to help those small muscles in your foot, we call those the intrinsics, especially when you're on your feet a long time, would be to do a toe exercise called toe yoga. You can bring your big toes up while keeping all your little toes down and then switching back and forth. Bring all those little toes up, big toes down. It is going to feel really challenging to do this, and that's because a lot of times we don't actually isolate the muscles in the feet. We don't isolate the intrinsics to work, but they're really involved in walking, in balancing all of our daily activity. All our weight goes into our feet. It's pretty amazing that our feet last as long and as well as they do. So we wanna make sure that we're taking care of them appropriately. So just a couple things to help you get started. Like I said, if you're experiencing more severe foot pain or you're not sure what to be looking for, check with your local physical therapist or your primary care physician or a podiatrist to see about getting either a customized or over-the-counter orthotic. Okay, that's it. Bye. That's all we got for Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. If you enjoyed this show, then support us on Patreon for exclusive content as well as the video of us recording this. We'll have special exercises we'll be writing as well as tips and tricks with tenor drumming and other instruments to come. Um, subscribe to us on YouTube for some tenor tutorials and possibly other tutorials later on. Um, and like us on Facebook at Podband Podcast.